Welcome. We're so glad you're here with us this evening. My name is uh, Reverend Scott Quinn. And I'm the Reverend Lynn Oldham Robinette. And we are with the Marin Interfaith Council and we welcome you to this Love Lives in Marin event. Love Lives in Marin is our initiative to promote inclusion and celebrate the dignity of every human being, particularly those who have been oppressed because of their religion, race, nation of origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, or who are differently abled. Tonight, we join in solidarity with Congregation Kol Shafar and Congregation Rodef Shalom during this week of Holocaust remembrance, as we stand in solidarity with our Jewish sisters and brothers in light of recent anti-Semitic events. Whether you are Jewish or are here as an ally, we welcome you. So just a few logistics uh, before we get started. Um, I'm sure by now all of us are well accustomed to Zoom, but just a few reminders. We're gonna start off um, with you giving an option of how you want to view everybody. So in the top right of your Zoom window is the view button. And you can either choose speaker view, which will then have as the focus of your screen, whoever's talking in the moment, or you can choose gallery view and take a look at all the wonderful faces of the people who have joined us here tonight. We are all in mute except for the speakers. Later on, the opportunity will arise for you to offer in chat questions that you would like our speakers to address. And so we'll have a chance to have some interaction that way. And as always, of course, at our Marine Interfaith Council events, we invite you to maintain an open heart and mind. You might hear some things tonight that you find unfamiliar, perhaps uncomfortable, or even challenging. And if so, give yourself a moment just to breathe deeply. Let yourself feel whatever you feel without judgment. And allow yourself to receive the perspectives of our speakers as ongoing food for reflection, as together we seek to make our world more whole, inclusive, and welcoming for everyone, with tonight a particular heart for our Jewish sisters and brothers. So it's my honor and pleasure to introduce um, our first speaker tonight, uh, my friend, neighbor, MIC board member, person celebrating a birthday. I'm so glad to have with us tonight, Rabbi Cantor Alana Rosen Brown of Congregation Rodef Shalom. Hi, everyone. Um, so honored to be here with this community tonight. Yes, it's my birthday. And um, I guess <laughs> wonderful to be spending it with you. Thank you, Scott. Um, when Reverend Scott Quinn and Reverend Lynn Oldham Robinette reached out to Rev Shalom and Kol Shofar to say that they wanted to host an, a Love Lives in Marin event specifically to have a conversation about anti-Semitism, I was deeply moved because um, of course for us as a Jewish community to have allies, um, which we know we have in our Marin community, um, but to have people who are reaching out specifically to have a conversation about anti-Semitism and how it impacts us as a Jewish community and to say, how can we help um, support your community? knowing that there's rising instances of anti-Semitism within the county and throughout the nation um, is just so deeply meaningful. And it's deeply meaningful to have this conversation in the same week that we as a Jewish community observe Yom HaShoah, which is Holocaust Remembrance Day as observed in our Jewish calendar, which I believe has been observed since 1951 as, and was first established by the state of Israel as a Holocaust Remembrance Day for our Jewish community. So just to open the conversation a bit about anti-Semitism, and we'll be talking about it throughout the evening. Anti-Semitism, as you know, is an age-old hatred that we as a Jewish community continue to live with and endure today in 2021. 
It is a hatred that has recognizable tropes, even as some of its forms and expressions may shift and change to fit the current moment. And it's a hatred that has led throughout history uh, to events ranging from exclusion from certain professions to mass community expulsions, such as what took place most famously in 1492 with the forced conversion or expulsion of more than 200,000 Jews from Spain, but actually in lesser known expulsions that took place throughout Europe during the Middle Ages. Um, to outbreaks of violence in the form of pogroms, to what culminated in the Nazi genocide of over 6 million Jews, two-thirds of European Jewry in the 1940s. Unfortunately, anti-Semitism did not end when the Allies defeated the Nazis and liberated the camps. Today, anti-Semitism continues to exist worldwide, and can look like casual schoolyard taunts and beatings to mass shootings to denial of the veracity of the Holocaust. And for us in the Jewish community, it also continues to exist as collective trauma, not only for members of our community who are survivors of the Holocaust and their descendants, um, but for all of us, it exists within us age old oppression that we carry with us today. It continues to be our work to heal from the trauma and move forward as a community in strength and love and connection to the many individuals in the world who we know partner with us to stand against anti-Semitism and the myriad forms that bigotry and prejudice can take. The philosopher Emil Fackenheim famously um, said, we must deny his Hitler a posthumous victory. And how do we do that? When we work for love in the world, when we stand against hatred, when we combat anti-Semitism in all of its forms, and when we have pride and love for Judaism and being Jewish, in doing that, we honor all of those who perished in the Holocaust, and we honor our Jewish community today. And so, um, we pause for a moment of silence to honor all of those who were killed in the Holocaust. And I'll then sing a prayer, Eli, Eli, before we continue. This prayer, Eli Eli, is a prayer that we often sing um, on Yom HaShoah. It was written by Hannah Senesh, who was a resistor and perished, perished when she parachuted into Hungary and was discovered. Eli, Eli, Shalom. Crash of the heavens, 
the prayer of the heart. So when Rabbi Susan Leiter and I first had a conversation about how we would begin this discussion of anti-Semitism in our community gathering tonight, uh, Rabbi Leiter said, why don't we invite Professor Deborah Lipstadt? And I'll tell you, we did look into inviting her here to visit with us tonight, and she wasn't available. But we thought we would begin with sharing a video from Professor Deborah Lipstadt. Many of you know her. She is an American historian, best known for some of her books entitled Denying the Holocaust, uh, History on Trial, My Day in Court with a Holocaust Denier, The Eichmann Trial, and in 2019, she published a book, Anti-Semitism Here and Now. So she's a foremost scholar on anti-Semitism, and we thought to begin with a conversation between her and the BBC journalist defining what is anti-Semitism, how does it show up today in 2021, here and now in our times, and after that, Rabbi Susan and I will have a discussion in response to some of Professor Lipstadt's conversation. And we'll have then speakers throughout the night and we'll have a chance to open it up to conversation. So I'm going to share now this conversation with Professor Deborah Lipstadt. Just one moment. Well, thank you for such a warm welcome. It is great to see so many of you here. It is slightly uncanny timing that today the Community Securities Trust announced a 16% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in the last year. We have seen a rise for three years running now, it is at a record high. But we're not competing for relevance tonight on news lines. We're talking about something that I think we have all recognized, globally recognized to be a phenomenon. And it's hard to think of anyone better placed than Deborah Lipstadt to bring us through this incredibly complicated time with more thought and more precision. I have to admit, I'd always thought of anti-Semitism as one thing, uh, Deborah, one whole, until I read this brilliant book, and it tackles it from so many angles. And I suddenly started thinking of sort of Eskimos and Inuits, and their 15 different words for snow. <laughs> and it made me see the subtleties in all the different kinds. Each chapter takes you through a new sort of anti-Semitism. We are, as it were, spoilt for choice. Um, so I don't know how many of you have sort of had a look yet, but um, Deborah really starts at the beginning, biblical anti-Semitism, white nationalist anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism from the progressive left, from the hard right, dinner party anti-Semitism, careless anti-Semitism, campus anti-Semitism, Islamist anti-Semitism, politically anti-Israel anti-Semitism. And then a very special point at the end, an anti-Semitism that is in danger, perhaps, of redefining a whole culture, a whole religion. So tonight we're going to try and explore as much of that um, as our time allows and explore how you find the, the counter arguments um, for what you sense to be happening. Um, I also want to explore the other things that are inherent in all this, that you start to perceive anti-Semitism wherever you go, yes. that you see it too widely. I think it was Danny Finkelstein used to tell me about joking with his schoolmates growing up. You know, he'd play football and when the ball hit the goalpost, be like, oh, anti-Semitic goal, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the anti-Semitic, you know, whatever it was. And he was laughing clearly, um, but for some it can dominate and it can overtake the actual focus on Judaism itself. What happens when a culture or a faith starts to see itself purely in the antagonism that it confronts, which is a, a very different sort of place that we may end up. Um, Deborah and I will be in conversation for about 40 minutes, and then we are delighted 
uh, to open it up to all of you and we welcome your questions. I, I perceive, I anticipate there will probably be um, very heartfelt experiences. Maybe that will be um, more than, than direct questions and that's absolutely fine. Just the, the briefer, the more succinct you are, the more of you we can include, which is what we'd love to do. Um, enough from me, Deborah Lipstadt. Let's start at the beginning because you do talk about where it comes from, which is one of the oddest things of all, the sort of biblical anti-Semitism yes. coming from the Adam and Eve or the Eve and snake. What's your understanding of the origins well, of it? I'm going to jump from what the Hebrew scriptures to the New Testament, because that's really where, where I see the roots of it or the template. Um, in the story of the death of Jesus, of the crucifixion, uh, as it has been taught and understood, um, by church fathers, and I'm not being sexist here because it was mainly fathers, um, that the reason that, that, or stepping back, the Jews, of course, Jesus was a Jew, the Jews were Jews, everyone in the story is Jewish except the Romans who actually crucified him, but that's an extraneous fact. The Jews wanted Jesus killed, crucified, uh, because he wanted to chase the money changers out of the temple. And they persuaded Rome, Rome did, the Roman authorities didn't want to do that, but they persuaded Rome to do it, crucify him, crucify him. And in that story, and the way that story was taught by many church leaders over millennia, you have the template for anti-Semitic charges. Anti-Semitism is not if you dislike a Jew. Go to any synagogue and you'll find, or synagogue board meeting, trustees, governors, and you'll find, you know, Jews hate, disagreeing and hating those other Jews. Um, but anti-Semitism will have those elements. Something to do with money, something to do with intelligence, with smarts, but clever, nefarious, and a malicious use of power. So that even when I talk about my friends, quote unquote, the deniers, if you were to ask a denier, well, why did the Jews make up this story? What is in it for them? The denier would say to you, well, what did the Jews get out of the Holocaust? And the traditional answer, even though this is historically open to debate, a state of Israel and lots of, and reparations, which is a fancy word for money. So therefore you have in that charge, that same template, money, and they got the allies, they managed to get the allies to do their bidding to pick, plant evidence uh, so that they could get a state, even though it would cause disruption in the Middle East, it might uh, disadvantage a people who were there, but so it's the same template. So before we actually, before we get up to the Holocaust, this idea that the narrative established with Jesus and the Pharisees mm -hmm. started the whole projection, if you like, yes. of anti-Semitism. I, I mean, that seems extraordinary that that has never wavered from right. that place, or do you think there have been periods of time when no, it has think it's. No, I think it's there. I describe, I, first of all, I call anti-Semitism the longest or the oldest hatred. Other historians have used that term as well. And it's got very deep roots. Now, this is a discomforting analogy, but I speak of anti-Semitism, I think of anti-Semitism as a herpes virus. You know, once you have herpes, um, for many years, now they have medicine that can actually eradicate it, but for many years it could not be, it was always in you, it was always lying dormant. And we all hear the horror stories of the bride who wakes up the morning of her wedding with a, a herpes sore on her lip or something, because it comes out under moments of stress. Anti-Semitism is deeply embedded in society and not just Western society. It's migrated to, the, to Muslim society, it's migrated to other societies. And in times of tension, in times of global dislocation, I think it emerges. Or when there are politicians, right or left, um, who want to use it to gin up support, it's a very convenient way to do it. Okay, so you've, you've taken me right into the right and left. Let's start with the right. Um, and you very early on talk about the Charlottesville rallies and President Trump in 2017 um, and Trump's reaction to the death of one woman at the hands of, of a far right demonstrator. Now, the phrase um, that has been used to me quite often in, in America 
in 2017 was the Ku Klux Klan have taken their hoods off. It's the same people, mm -hmm. they just don't feel the need to disguise That's their right. faces anymore. Do, do you sense that there is growing, or is it like the herpes, just louder? You're just seeing the cold sore. I think it's both. I think it's growing. You hear too many stories, too many anecdotes, and one is always uh, loath to make uh, generalization of anecdotes, but if you hear them enough, you begin to say something is happening here of young people, of people on the street being accosted, being things being yelled at them, things being said to them, um, dinner party conversations, where people feel that they can say certain things that they couldn't say before. They can express certain things that they couldn't express before. And in my country, it's not just in relation to Jews, but it's also in relation to uh, immigrants, refugees, people of color, et cetera. So I think that it's um, the mask is off or the cover is off and more people have picked up on it. So it's both. And when people say, come on, you know, you're overplaying this. This is, it's not exactly the 1930s. You know, mm -hmm. we're not about to see fascism take over the world, get it in perspective. What's your answer to My that? My answer to that is it's not like the 1930s. If you think about the reaction to Pittsburgh, governments worldwide condemn what happened or when studies come out showing anti-Semitism. This is not government, by and large, there are governments, we can talk about Hungary, Poland, United States, no, well, we'll know about that. Uh, um, but, um, it's the, I don't think it's the 1930s, but you have to remember that genocide never begins with the decision by the genocideer to kill. It begins first with words. Think about Rwanda, the radio stations from the Congo. Um, it begins with incitement. So I don't know where it's going, and I don't think it's going towards a genocide, but it was going far enough so that 11 people who went to synagogue on an October morning in Pittsburgh are dead. Um, and th those kind of things are, are, are not easily sloughed off. You've talked about the right and the left. Do you think there is a difference of approach? Yes. Um, I think on the, the, here's the irony. The right looks upon the Jew as not being white. That killer who went into, that murderer who went into the Tree of Life synagogue, was yelling about the Jews destroying the white people because this synagogue had sponsored a, uh, a Shabbat in, in support of Hayas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which was started to aid immigrants, Jewish immigrants, and now aids refugees and immigrants worldwide. Um, and for him, Jews were not white and Jews were destroying his country by aiding refugees and aiding immigrants to come into the country. On the left, uh, you see less violence, but you see more institutionalization. And you know, the 900 pound whatever sitting in the middle of the room, of course, is, is the Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn. And I'm loath to come to, you know, bring coals to Newcastle uh, or, uh, you know, to, to, to talk about something local when I'm, I'm not a local. But I think, you know, it was one commentator who said that, you know, Jeremy Corbyn rarely or if ever uh, meets an anti-Semite that he doesn't somehow find a reason to embrace. Now, I'm not suggesting, and I want to be very clear here, I'm not suggesting that he's necessarily an anti-Semite. I have no idea what's in his heart. And I think that's irrelevant. I think the whole conversation is, is this person an anti-Semite or not, is irrelevant. I think what is relevant is, does their behavior facilitate anti-Semitism? Does their behavior gin up, you know, whip up anti-Semitic sentiments? And I think in that case, uh, it's case closed for Jeremy Corbyn and to a certain degree for Donald Trump. You quote um, Alan Johnson, a former uh, Labour Health Secretary, amongst other things, as describing Corbyn as someone who does not indulge in anti-Semitism himself, but indulges the right. anti-Semitism of It's not it. Alan Johnson, the politician. It's Alan Johnson, misidentified in the book. It's, oh. Alan, it's Alan Johnson, the scholar. Um, I and that, that was right, it's, unusually forthcoming. Right. No, 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 no. Um, that one off. But in any case, I think that's a very apt comment. It's a very apt comment. Um, and 
you know, I think that if a person such as Jeremy Corbyn, the people around him, or other progressives, people in, now sitting in the House of Representatives in the United States, were to encounter an anti-Semite who looked like a Hitler variety, an extremist, you know, that there was no question that this was an anti-Semite, um, uh, talking about love of, of Nazism or the Charlottesville people marching down the street with their arm outstretched, uh, chanting Jews will not replace us. They would recognize those as anti-Semites. But when you move away from that extremist variety and you get to the other varieties, when you get to the dinner party anti-Semite, when you get to the person, you know, talk about Israel, um, you know, First of all, to again say something which I think many people in this audience would know, but criticism of Israeli policies is not anti-Semitism. If you want to see criticism of Israeli policies, read Haaretz, you know? <laughs> Go to the Knesset and sit in on a debate on the Knesset and you'll see extreme criticism. Deborah, oh, yeah, I just, I don't want to get too ahead of this. Oh. So we're going to stop it there. Um, the reason that Rabbi Leiter and I chose that clip specifically, um, and I think those of you who have been a part of this conversation on anti-Semitism and specifically anti-Semitism in the age of Trump and now what it looks like now, uh, know that uh, Professor Lipstadt spoke of a lot of the conversation that we talk about. Anti-Semitism on the left and on the right the historical roots of anti-Semitism, where did they come from, um, how is anti-Semitism and um, Israel often used as a wedge issue in politics, and many, and, and the rise uh, in instances of anti-Semitism that we've seen in the last number of years. So that's why we use the clip to kind of start the conversation. And then I want to invite Rabbi Leiter also right now to be in conversation with me. Maybe we can add her there she is. Hi, Rabbi Leiter. Hi there. Ha happy birthday to you, Rabbi Alana. Um, what a topic to be uh, to be taking on 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 a on a joyous day like your birthday. So I want to start our conversation tonight, reflecting on um, Professor Lipstadt's remarks, um, thinking about what are our own experiences. I mean, here we are, two rabbis in Marin County. Um, and we're going to be talking a lot about love, uh, but before the love comes sometimes this pain, right? And this rejection and an identification of, of feeling the sting of anti-Semitism, even in what I would call my own very pri privileged life um, as a human being and as a Jew. Um, but what, what does that look like for you in your, in your life? What, when is a time that you could share with us tonight when you felt that? Yeah, it feels important to share uh, personally because, you know, certainly for me growing up Jewish, I grew up in West Hartford, Connecticut. It's a town with many synagogues, of all denominations. I grew up in the early 1980s, but I knew about anti-Semitism from a very young age. There was always a synagogue you know, at some point in my childhood that um, had some graffiti on it or a swastika, of course, you know, I knew growing up Jewish what a swastika, how to identify a swastika from a very young age. I knew that hatred against me existed. And I think um, this is something important to, to bring out um, that when, when you're Jewish, um, you know about anti-Semitism and you experience anti-Semitism, even, even in the United States today, even with all of the privilege that, that I grew up with and with all the privilege that I had. Um, you know, I, I, the Holocaust was very much in our consciousness growing up in the 1980s. Um, and, um, And I think I learned at a young age not to be afraid when I saw a swastika. And this is something I've had to reflect on later on that almost um, 
it was if it was normalized to me in some way. Um, I felt by and large protected by the community. There was an outcry, but I almost expected it. And I reflect on that now specifically with what's happening in Marin and, and perhaps, and I hope there's more of an outcry today than there was when I was growing up. Um, but just of, you know, the internalized understanding that there was hatred against me that I came to expect or kind of walk past a swastika without thinking about it, because of course there were people in the world who, who hated me. Um, and I think that's important to bring up. And then Susan, we've talked about this. Uh, when I've traveled in Europe, I've felt um, anti-Semitism in a way that I do not feel it in the United States. I've walked the Camino de Santiago uh, many times and I was many people's first Jew that they met. Um, and this was within the past 10 years. I remember wandering into Pamplona and um, sitting on a bench and there was a hipster there, it looked about my age um, and we started talking and he didn't realize I was Jewish and all of the anti-Semitic tropes came out about Jews as money lenders with long noses. You know, this was, this was within the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And eventually I shared that I was Jewish and we had a conversation about it. Um, but in Europe, I have experienced um, anti-Semitism um, very publicly um, on many occasions. Yeah, I, I remember uh, reflecting back when we were um, first beginning our conversations about tonight and um, a memory came back to me very vividly from 2019 when I was in Warsaw and with my husband and um, we were in the square, very historic area, beautifully recreated um, in this kind of almost mythical um, architectural style. And we saw, a, we saw a table with a large yellow and black banner with books spread out and people were gathered around the table and um, I do not know Polish, but I quickly got out my phone to do some Google Translate to see what was going on. And I realized that this was an initiative um, in Polish society that a political initiative to address the concern about Holocaust reparations being asked to be paid, um, paid by the country. And I went closer and I saw that there were there were books on the table and I looked up some of the authors and there was Holocaust revisionist, um, you know, pamphlets on the table. And it was a large uh, celebration, a nationalist holiday in, in as we have, right, in the 4th of July and other things here, but uh, this, this, this holiday and really beginning to feel afraid of that, you know, again, just several years ago of what, you know, what that could mean for me. Did someone know I was Jewish? And, and what it meant to to see that in such a in such a public place and and in Poland, I, of course, of all places. When I think about my earliest memories, though, um, I was, as some people know, was not raised Jewish, and so some of my first encounters were when I started dating someone who was Jewish and experienced my family's reaction to that. So I, in particular. Um, remember someone in my family uh, who, when they met my now husband said, well, he's, he's all right for being Jewish, right? I don't like Jews, but I like him. So this kind of um, perhaps like the hipster on the bench, Alana, right? Like, well, you're different, right? I have this perception, but I'm now I'm talking to you and, and you're different. And how offensive and how difficult that was to think that someone I loved um, would perceive someone else I loved um, in this in this very marginalizing um, marginalizing way. So um, I also will share one last memory that maybe one more personal memory, and then also um, going back to Europe to close. Um, also through my husband, he went to uh, college in the South in a place where. Um, some people he went to school with also had never really met a Jew who presented quite like him. And it was the same kind of thing. Like if he were walking through campus and um, 
the rabbi, a campus rabbi, Chabad rabbi would walk through the campus. They would make disparaging remarks right in front of my husband, but then they would say, oh, but he's different, right? You're different. He's different from you. You're, you're okay, right? And so being very conscious of um, joining the Jewish people and understanding what that burden was. And, and my family was quite concerned for me, saying, do you really understand what you're getting into by joining the Jewish people? And I'll close with two, um, two more memories from Europe. One was um, visiting um, the concentration camp Dachau when I was 17 years old. And, um, and through my years, my teenage years, the Holocaust was also very loomed large for me. And I read many, many books in my teenage years about that. Um, and then back, you know, going back to 2019 and um, going to Auschwitz-Birkenau and experiencing that um, as an adult, as a rabbi, as someone who's been Jewish now for, for decades, um, really deeply, deeply um, difficult and, and moving and important, important experiences. But I'm, I'm curious, I'd love to ask you a question, Alana, because I was really struck by, um, and, and Dr. Lipstadt warned us in the video about this, this, this um, graphic kind of herpes analogy. And I've been thinking a lot about, you know, she's talked about how you couldn't eradicate up to a certain point, um, you couldn't eradicate herpes until there was this cure that was, that was brought about for that. And it really made me think about this question of, you know, is there a cure for anti-Semitism? Like, what do you think? Is it out there? Can it be grasped? Has it, has it ever been realized in any way, shape or form, do you think? I, I'm smiling. Everyone might think that it's strange that I'm smiling, but I'm smiling mm -hmm. because you, you had written me that question and I, I saw that and I thought, how am I going to answer that <laughs> question? Um, what um, what I see as the cure is really, you know, I don't see that we're anywhere near a cure um, because I've seen um, education, you know, since certainly since the 1960s, um, you know, when you go to visit the Anne Frank Museum in Amsterdam and know that the Anne Frank, uh, the diary of Anne Frank is one of the most um, translated into all languages throughout the world and required reading in so many places throughout the world. Um, you know, I, I truly, truly believe that, um, that we have um, allies, that, this, that the story of the Holocaust um, and the understanding um, that something like that should never happen again um, is an understanding that is shared um, by, by many, many who, people who love humanity worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I, I am a Holocaust educator. I have um, taken teens and taught them the history of Europe in, in Europe at Auschwitz. It was one of the most moving experiences that I've had in my life because of, you know, my own history is, is to, um, you know, share the sacred um, stories of people who, who passed at Auschwitz and, and to hold their stories and feel like I was not worthy of sharing these stories. Um, and, and to know the many people, both Jewish and non-Jewish, who have um, journeyed to Auschwitz to deeply understand how, how, how is this the conclusion of, um, of bullying on the playground? You know, how, how does, how did these words lead here? And so, so I am profoundly moved by the commitment that um, that educators have made to ensuring that this will never happen again. And yet, um, you know, it is, it's truly pernicious, um, this hatred of this anti-Semitism. It has such deep roots. And I think until um, we truly as a society 
you know, make, make a commitment, every one of us in schools and beyond to understanding um, the deep roots. Um, no, I, 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 I just, um, it, you know, it will continue, but it, it um, hopefully will never develop into um, what we've seen in the past. Yeah. What happens, Susan, what, that, it's such a hard question. Yeah, I, I knew it was a hard one. <laughs> Didn't mean to throw it, throw it right out there. You're at your feet there, but I, yeah, I, I think I think about it as the education piece is really important. But then there's also this ongoing practice, right? And that the education doesn't uh, isn't it doesn't affect anything without an open heart, right? So what is it that opens people's hearts to understand that that way of life, that way of really what Dr. Lipschat talked about is that it begins with words, right? That that way of speaking about people, objectifying people, marginalizing people leads to, to that, right? And, um, and, and so I think that there's a guarding, there's a shmira, there's, there's an ongoing kind of spiritual practice and guarding against that in, in all of ourselves, right? To always, to try to be inclusive, to try to be aware when that creeps into our, that fear or um, separation seeps, seeps into our, into ourselves. So yeah. I don't think there's any right answer to that difficult question that she, that she posed or that yeah. I guess her, her teaching sparked in me. Yeah, and I'll just say, and then I, I know we have to move on, but um, we have a unique challenge in our day and age, which is social media, and that voices are amplified in the amplified and spread going back to the virus um, in ways that they haven't been before. And so while I actually truly believe that, um, that fewer people um, are actively practicing anti-Semitism than, than used to. Those, those who are, their voices are amplified. And, um, and, and that is a huge challenge that the ADL, and we'll talk about it at the end, but when we talk about how can you be an ally, it really is understanding how to combat some of these um, uses of technology that are amplifying anti-Semitism, amplifying all the hatreds online in ways that are having a disastrous and profound uh, impact. Right, and, and, in, and in, uh, in, in our correspondence words, our BBC journalist who was interviewing Dr. Lushek kind of talked about that, the real danger of it, redefining a whole religion and how social media amplifies that, right? Makes us even more afraid, makes us even more reticent to be out with our Jewishness, makes us want to hide or to only def define our Judaism by what we're not or what we're against. Um, yeah, so well. Maybe you'll wanna end there, Rabbi Leiter, because I know that um, for, for us as rabbis, this is so important. How do we define our Judaism and move forward in Jewish community holding that um, anti-Semitism exists, um, but that there's something uh, so much more to our community and our Judaism than being defined by that history. So talk to me a little bit about how you uh, mm -hmm. teach in the face yeah, well, I want to I want to reflect a little bit on on kind of what that one of those moments look like for me of what is a response, what does what does love look like, and um, I want to do that by reflecting back to 2017 when I was asked um, to join 20 other rabbis um, to to go on a solidarity mission to one of the most unlikely places in the United States, to the small community of Whitefish, Montana, of all places, and um, specifically to do a pastoral visit really to the Jewish community of Whitefish. So Whitefish during those years had become a focal point for white supremacist anger. Um, there. And you can read about all those details. It's a terrible and horrible and terrifying story. Um, and when we went to visit that, um, there was a march of white supremacists um, that was planned in Whitefish on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. 
And the Jewish community there was petrified about this, what this type of march would elicit and, and the danger that it would um, pose to their community. And so we, this was a community that was um, in trauma, really. And we went to visit, we went to bring love. We went to bring chesed, as we say in the Jewish tradition, and to gather and to, to be in solidarity with this small little community that was under attack, um, amplified, as you said, Rabbi Alana, right, by trolling, by all kinds of electronic means and really an army of trolls that had been kind of amassed against them across the nation, outnumbering them. And so we saw there one of, um, one of the great heroes, Rabbi Francine Rostin, who was leading this community, someone who was um, in her home. Um, her home was the synagogue. Um, and so when this, when this community was threatened, it was literally her family and her home, her personal safety. And we went and we gathered together and we comforted the community. And there was an amazing concert that we attended together. We lifted each other up and did all those things. And so when I was there, I learned that through the Montana Human Rights Commission, they had an incredible movement called Love Lives in Whitefish. And I was so touched by this. They would do all kinds of amazing things to lift love up in the presence of hate. Um, they would take public stands, but it wasn't so much about demonstrating. It was about kind of lifting love up so high that there wasn't going to be room for all that other stuff. And so when I came back, I spoke with um, Reverend Scott Quinn about that in my, um, um, in my role as a, as a Marin Interfaith Council board member. And we said, you know, why do we, we need to do this here in Marin? Why do we need to wait um, for something bad or worse to happen, <laughs> right? Let's, let's start this initiative here in Marin. And so that is how Love Lives in Marin started um, here with the Marin Interfaith Council. We needed this movement. We still need this movement. There are many on this call tonight who are aware of the um, incidences of anti-Semitism that have happened here in our county since Love, Live in, Love Lives in Marin has been founded, underscoring the need for this type of movement across our county more than ever. We have had high school students in our county put on Jew lists and have been threatened by other students. We have had someone enter the town of Fairfax and plaster swastika stickers over different locations downtown. We have had even, you know, Rabbi Alana, even just today, I received, I received a voicemail message from a member of our larger community who's been traumatized by threats of anti-Semitism and wanted to meet with the rabbi. So these things are unfolding, have unfolded in our community um, at an increased rate, at an alarming rate, at a rate that takes, um, that, that takes our breath away and that um, demands our attention and demands kind of flooding the county with love and activism and taking a stance and, and encouraging people to stand up and to be allies. So I want to, um, I want to introduce someone very special from our community um, who's going to talk with us a little bit about her experience. And I want to, it's hard to know how to introduce her, um, but I will do my best. Um, but Esther Rosha Stadler, longtime member of Congregation Kul Shofar, is also um, the child of a Holocaust survivor. And in her great activism and taking a stand against anti-Semitism in our community, she has done many different things. But one of the hallmarks of her leadership has been her, her faithful, um, I don't even know all the things that she does to put together the Jewish communities annual Yom HaShoah Holocaust Remembrance Day ceremony that this year is happening on Thursday night. And one of the reasons that we wanted to partner with Marin Interfaith to have this event tonight is to amplify the great and important uh, memory and the lifting up of so many lives 
that we hear about every year when we gather at Holocaust Remembrance Day. So there will be very a very specific um, ceremony and very specific speakers who will share their stories on Thursday night. But tonight, we specifically invited Esther to come forward to speak because she has a story as a child of a survivor now living in Marin County um, and sharing with us her unique perspective of how this is unfolding for her to live in a place where these things are now happening. And, and what does that mean for us, uh, not only in the Jewish community, but as a part of a larger community? So I welcome forward Esther Rosha Stadler to share some thoughts with us. Thank you, Rabbi Leiter. And thank you for allowing me to share my story of being a daughter, the daughter of two Holocaust survivors. And happy birthday, Rabbi Ilana. Both of my parents endured five years of imprisonment in multiple concentration camps, including Auschwitz. They both endured grueling slave labor, starvation, and unimaginable cruelty, all with the possibility of being killed at any moment. Both were near death when they were liberated after the war. They lost their families, both nuclear and extended. Almost a hundred people in my family were murdered by the Nazis. I think I always knew about the Holocaust even before I heard words about it. Something terrible happened and I could feel it. The information seeped into my psyche because it was all around me and because it was embedded in my parents. That's not to say that my home was dark and gloomy all the time. It wasn't. There was laughter, music, uh, celebrations, and plenty of joy. But there was also an underlying sadness, a deep sense of loss, of mistrust, and fear. My mother was petrified that something terrible was going to happen to us. It was as if my brother and I were more than just her children, as if we were also making up for the family that she lost. My family was different than the other families in the neighborhoods where I grew in the neighborhood where I grew up. The other kids' parents hadn't been through what my parents had. The other kids didn't know what I knew. I knew that it wasn't safe in this world because Nazis existed. As a child, my boogeymen wore brown uniforms, shiny black boots, and a red armband with a swastika on it. I had nightmares about the Nazis pounding on our door and ripping me away from my parents. I wondered, could I survive a concentration camp? But as I grew up, my fears faded. After all, I was living in San Francisco where peace and love was touted, not hatred and murder. I was a bit of a rebellious teenager and imagined myself standing up to and fighting the Nazis, even if it meant death. And I haven't lived in fear since then, at least until these last few years. All of these overt acts of anti-Semitism and racism has multiplied and it's reminiscent of how the Holocaust started. Now I am afraid. I'm afraid for our country. I'm afraid not only for Jews, but for all peoples being targeted now, even here in bucolic, beautiful Marin County, anti-Semitism is rearing its ugly head. There are some people that believe that their race is superior to other races. But I believe that each one of us in our varying cultures, colors of skin and religious beliefs are all part of one race. 
the human race. That's why I appreciate the Interfaith Council and its member organization. It gives us an opportunity to learn about each other's religions and our shared values. We support each other and we stand up for each other when it's needed. Love lives in our respect and support for each other. We gather each year to commemorate Yom HaShoah to remember this horrific devastation inflicted on our people and to mourn the murder of 6 million Jews. Together, we say Kaddish, our prayer for the dead, and we hear Holocaust survivors tell their stories and experiences in the Holocaust. We gather so that we never forget and we reaffirm our commitment to never again allow anything like that to happen. We must, all of us, stand up to anti-Semitism and racism together, side by side, because we've seen, we know what it can lead to. And Yom HaShoah reminds us. Thank you so much, Esther, for sharing from your heart, sharing your story. And um, I'm going to turn it over now to um, Lynn and to Scott. Hmm. Thank you so much, Esther, for sharing from your heart, your story, and the story of your parents. Thank you, Rabbi Leiter. Thank you, Rabbi Rosen Brown, for your perspectives of soul and heart and mind and for um, allowing us to join with you and learn from you and to hold our hearts open with you. Um, I did want to put into uh, the chat the information on Thursday's observance, uh, the Yom HaShoah uh, observance and the information for how you can register for that. So that's in chat. Um, and really where we wanted to focus in the next couple of minutes was some wisdom, insight, suggestions for those of us who do not identify as Jewish, how can we practice love here in Marin and beyond? How can we be allies? What does it look like to be supportive? Um, we can all be people of good intention, but our intentions may not be well informed. So whoever wishes uh, to start, if you could offer us a day or two or more <laughs> on uh, what can we who are here in the spirit of Loveless Marin to let our love shine brightly and be in solidarity and support of the Jewish community, opposing anti-Semitism and um, practicing a very active love. What, that, what might that look like? Rabbi Alana, do you want me to jump in? Do you want to jump in first or? Either way, Rabbi Leiter, you're welcome to go ahead. Uh, I don't know, I was thinking as, <coughs> as you were speaking, Rabbi Alana, and then I also again, Esther, at the end of your remarks of how important it is. And although Esther, you didn't really use exactly these words, I'm gonna say that public condemnation is really important. And I feel like sometimes, especially with social media, we can be in this push pull where we think, if I put something out on social media, is it really, is it really gonna do anything? Isn't everyone else doing this, right? But it is, it's important to take a public stand there. And it's of course, even harder to take a public stand in the face of a, an interaction that you see, right? When you, when you see something, say something. Um, and so I think those are, those are such important, important um, aspects of being an ally. And it's, it's not easy to overcome that own, your own fear and self-doubt. I absolutely agree, Rabbi Leiter. And, um, you know, I'm sure there are many people here on this call who have their their own ideas. And after we discuss, I'd love to hear their thoughts in the chat. But 
I'm actually thinking about um, how we can be allies before the incident happens. I'm sorry for my cat in back of me. Um, but how meaningful it is to me, um, and we talked about, you know, pride in being Jewish and, and loving being Jewish, how meaningful it is to me when um, friends of mine or people in the Marin community who don't celebrate Jewish holidays reach out to, um, to wish me a happy Passover. I mean, it really, it, it, it begins there, these gestures of kindness and awareness of, of who I am as a Jew, of taking the time to, um, to know about the Jewish calendar, to learn about, to learn about Judaism um, is deeply meaningful, deeply personal for me. I feel deeply kind of accompanied and, and seen and recognized um, in who I am. So I think um, it can begin begin there um, before you know before a hate crime happens to to read about the history of anti-Semitism to understand um, more deeply the roots you know it goes back before the roots in the Christian Bible um, and you know different historians have have different perspectives but to deeply understand that history. Um, and then to be in conversation with me, to be in conversation with us about it is deeply meaningful. I feel deeply accompanied when somebody says to me, I'd like to talk with you about uh, anti-Semitism and your understanding, and I'm trying to deeply understand it. I always welcome that conversation. Um, and then I will say that in Marin, um, on so many occasions, um, we have many friends in the Muslim community. The Muslim community is often the first to call us when there's a bomb threat um, at the JCC, when um, there's news that a swastika has been written um, somewhere. The Muslim community always calls us. Reverend Scott Quinn, one of the first always to call us. The Venetia Valley School um, across the street from Road of Shalom will send over flowers or a note or a card. And um, when I am the recipient of that kind of kindness, I also think to myself, how can I be more aware of um, other communities, um, other religions, um, and how I can be reaching out and aware of the news that affects them on a daily basis and share that kindness. So those, those are just a few of the thoughts that, that come to mind for me, but it's really um, proactive in understanding what is Judaism? What's to love about Judaism? And if there's, um, you know, there are some difficult issues that we haven't discussed, um, and nor do we may we may not have time on this call. Um, but there may be moments where you don't understand why. And by the way, the Jewish community isn't one community; <laughs> it's many communities with multiple opinions. Um, so, not thinking of us as as one community, but if um, if you don't understand why um, we might take umbrage to something or um, there's, you know, an issue in Israel politics that is bothering you to reach out to someone and ask if you can talk about it to understand more. I think just, um, you know, rather than um, being in relationship to headlines and to memes is um, deeply, deeply, deeply important, especially at this time when ire can be amplified on the internet so easily. There are issues of great nuance that we need to talk about at a deeper level together. And they can become wedge issues for us between our communities, between, in communities that might be likely allies in solidarity against hatred, but they can be they can come between us because we forget to reach out to ask beyond the headlines. Esther, anything that you would like to add in regard to? I agree with what both of you said. And I think it's really important for, for us to cross those lines of religion and get to know each other's, you know, faiths and beliefs and, um, you know, both ways that they get to know Judaism, we get to know other religions. Um, and 
when I grew up, I grew up in a neighborhood that there weren't a lot of Jews around. My best friends were Catholics. And, um, you know, every year I would wish them a happy Easter, a Merry Christmas and all the different holidays. And just this year, my oldest friend from grammar school started sending me text Chag Sameach Pesach, or, you know, wishing, wishes for me. And it meant so much to me, you know, it just meant a lot to me. And, um, and also just standing up together, you know, like I said, standing side by side um, and um, up to against anti-Semitism or any kind of racism that we work together and acknowledge more of our um, sameness rather than our differences. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Rabbi Susan, Rabbi Alana. Um, we did want to save a few minutes for questions. Um, so how we would do that is if you want to type a question into the chat um, for any of our three speakers tonight or for um, all three, um, if you want to type that into chat, that would be a wonderful thing. I did already get one uh, question while we're waiting to see uh, what might appear in chat. Um, and that was, uh, I received a message asking if there was any further information about what happened at Redwood High School and the keeping of a list of Jewish students, if there was any further information on where that stands or if there's been a response to that or something the high school has done to address it to, to any of your knowledge. Um, Rabbi Alana, I don't know if you've been updated on that case lately. Um, I have not. Um, and so I think one of, the, one of the things that we face in these cases is um, often not having access to all of the information due to issues that surround uh, whether it's a school district or, um, or the criminal justice system in some cases. And so um, I do not know. I have not heard an update on that in recent months. Rabbi Alana, how about you? No, there might be others on this call that are following more closely, but, yeah. but I'm where you are. But we continue to be on the lookout for it. And by the way, I, I didn't mention earlier that while that particular incident is um, it, it, people on this call are, are aware of, um, there are a myriad of other incidences that go unreported to people beyond coming to the rabbi. And so, um, you know, Rabbi Alana and I have talked about that, that um, for some reason, many reasons, people who come to us with these concerns don't want us to go to the school district, don't go to the school districts themselves in this, in the case of when we're dealing with children. And um, it's extremely difficult. So, um, we are aware of those things and try to get involved and be responsive and take a stand whenever we can within the constraints. And on Thursday at Yom, our Yom HaShoah, there will be a teen speaker from Redwood High School who addresses that. Thank you, Esther, for letting us know that. So again, if there's a question that you have, if you could put that into chat. Um, um, Scott, I, I do see a comment about um, teacher training um, in the city um, that, excuse me, in the county that was done at one point in partnership with um, the Tools for Tolerance training from the Simon Wiesenthal Museum in Los Angeles. Um, so I am aware of wonderful efforts underway right now, partnerships between um, Jewish Children and Family Service, the Holocaust Center there, and the County Office of Education. Um, and um, 
And so I am very heartened by those efforts that are underway right now. Um, and you know, those there's been information shared about those efforts by the director of the Holocaust Center um, in San Francisco at Jewish Family Children's Services. We're very heartened to know that this is currently underway in the county, efforts around that. And Lynn, I'll just go ahead and take this one since we just have one other question that just came in. Um, any info or thoughts on the anti-Semitic attacks that happened at San Marin High School a couple of years ago, a year or two ago? Rabbi Alana, are you aware? I am not aware of those particular um, events. Um, the events that I am most familiar with um, were at Redwood High School, um, but it, it, is an op it is an opportunity to, to urge people to when these attacks happen to please, please, please report them to the Anti-Defamation League because it's very important that they are tracked. Um, and so even when it is very difficult to have consequences or action brought against or perpetrators identified, it is still really important that the acts actually get reported um, because this is how we are aware of trends and how it actually ends up being able to shape um, the criminal justice system, right? When we have the more information and, and to bring that around about. And so um, the Anti-Defamation League, of course, is a very, very good source for understanding more about how that works. And you can go to their website to check that out. Thank you, Rabbi Leiter. And I would add, you know, so that's the advocacy piece. There's always an advocacy piece. Um, there's an education piece, and then there's a pastoral piece. And so a lot of people are asking, you know, questions, uh, follow up for what's been happening in the high schools. And part of our, our follow up as Jewish community is to check in with our kids and our teens um, and to make sure they're okay. And so um, very actively in our congregations, we have groups of teens, um, we have groups of teens gathering in Jewish spaces um, that are safe spaces where they can share these experiences mm -hmm. and also interfaith spaces that are being crea created intersectional spaces um, so that we can understand, you know, what is, you know, what is the long-term impact of hearing on a regular basis. Um, and, and often, again, they go unreported. It might be um, just jokes, jokes, just jokes. They're never just jokes, jokes in the schoolyard, um, but that we do have pastoral spaces um, in our communities for teens to share this. And one thing, Rabbi Leiter, I thought you were going to go in earlier, but really, you know, how do we um, grow in love of Judaism and Jewish community and Jewish tradition and not have anti Semitism being basic? anti-Semitism shaping our understanding of Jewish identity, um, but that, um, but love of Judaism and, and other aspects of our history that um, beautiful aspects of our Jewish history um, forming the basis and identity of our, you know, young, young people in our community. Mm. We haven't even talked about college campuses, but um, you know, of course, preparing our young people to to go to college with the atmosphere that's on at college campuses today. Thank you, Rabbi Alana, for lifting that up because I didn't I didn't go into as much depth around that um, earlier as I would have liked. Um, but how true it is to define ourselves by what is positive. Um, and to not only define ourselves by what we're not or what we stand against. Yeah, and I think we're, you know, very much, you know, um, if anything, the last four years has given all of us new language for how to work in solidarity um, against, you know, white supremacy and white nationalism, um, where which brings, which has, as Deborah Lipstadt brought forth, brought talked about in the clip. Um, brought forth um, and reemerged um, so many hatreds. Um, and so there are ways of working together in intersectional spaces where um, 
you know, um, there are times that um, we as Jews might step back to hear other stories. And then there are times when, um, when we too will need to be supported by others. So I think we are still learning and navigating um, how to create strong intersectional movements um, where there's difference, there's clearly um, different histories of the hatreds that have existed um, in America, um, different um, levels of oppression and expression of that in America, and how do we move forward together to um, extinguish white supremacy and white nationalism? Mm. 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 Thank you so much, Esther, Rabbi Susan, Rabbi Alana, for your perspectives, for your leadership, for your heart, for just beginning that uh, this is a very long uh, ongoing conversation that we're going to continue to have in multiple ways multiple venues but thank you for helping us to go even deeper in our own uh, heart and mind opening and for giving us the opportunity to learn from you being solidarity together and particularly as as uh, you emphasized at the end learning how we uh, all can focus on what we love and call that forward. And um, adoring not only um, the, all the, the beautiful uh, tradition of Judaism and of the Jewish people, but also for those of us from different perspectives, all of our traditions that together have as the foundational root of love. Mm -hmm. So thank you for being with us tonight. Um, we're going to do a couple of just final announcement things, and then um, Rabbi Leiter will call you back to, to do our final closing. Um, so, so grateful to you. Um, I'm still here, so I'll just say just my gratitude to you for hosting this conversation. Mm -hmm. And thank you for joining us on your birthday, <laughs> Rabbi Leiter. Oh, no, please, no, more. <laughs> no. no. Don't, don't center me anymore. <laughs> Um, and uh, thanks also to uh, Ryan Robinette uh, for providing all of our logistics tonight and to my coworker, Lynn. So I'll turn it over to Lynn right now. Thank you so much, Lynn, for helping put this together. Thank you. And, and thank you, uh, Esther and Rabbi Alana and Rabbi Susan for joining us um, and for sharing your words and your stories. Um, and thank you all who are here uh, watching and listening. Um, it takes all of us to make this world a better place. So please join us for our future Love Lives in Marin events. Um, we plan to hold future events using this sort of format to be in solidarity with others experiencing hate or oppression, including people of color, the LGBTQ community, and people who are differently abled. If you are not yet subscribed to our e-newsletter, please go to our website to sign up. And um, I'll try and put this in the chat, but it's www.marinifc.org. That's the best way to keep updated on upcoming events. And we invite you to join us for all our MIC events, not just uh, Love, Lives, and Marin. So two upcoming ones, one is our monthly interfaith meditation which we have every second wednesday of the month so the next one is april the 14th at 5 30 p.m um, and i saw our leader was with us tonight annie jorgensen who is with the brahma kamaris and is also an mic board member so join us 5 30 next wednesday for that and then our annual prayer breakfast which hopefully next year we'll be back at uh, Congregation Kol Shafar, as we all, as we norm, normally are to celebrate uh, the international the interfaith prayer breakfast, um, but this year again it's going to be on Zoom, and that's going to be on Tuesday, May the fourth, and our three speakers are going to be uh, Rabbi Paul Steinberg, Sylvia Borstein, and uh, Reverend Anita Anita Adesanya. So please join us for that. Um, you can find all the information that in our next in our MIC newsletter. But again, there'll be 9 a.m. on Tuesday, May 4th via Zoom. So please join us for that and for all of our MIC events as together we seek to create a world that's more whole, inclusive, just, and founded and rooted in the love 
that's witnessed by all of our faith traditions. So we close tonight um, with a final word um, from uh, Rabbi Susan Leiter. Thank you so much, Rabbi Leiter. Thank you so much to Scott and Lynn and to Ryan, Rabbi Alana. Um, thank you for your partnership and being here tonight um, and spreading love and lifting um, up this goodness that the world needs. So, you know, if you've ever noticed that um, the great Jewish default is to always talk about shalom, it's to always talk about peace. And um, it may seem a bit trite at times, but there is a, there is a supreme reason for this. Um, the prayer for peace permeates um, our daily prayers. We pray three times a day, and um, there are many, many prayers that end with the words, Ose shalom bimrama, huya ase shalom, aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael ve'al kol tevel ve'imru, amen. May the one who makes heavens in the earth bring peace down um, from the heavens to the earth for all of Israel and for all who dwell on earth. And we say amen. So these words are really percolate throughout our sacred liturgy. One of the things that I um, really love about the last line and um, the full kind of for people who are familiar with it this idea that it's not just Ose Shalom Bimramav Huya Ase Shalom Aleinu Ve'al Kol Yisrael. It's not just the people Israel for whom we're praying for for peace, but for literally everyone who dwells on this earth. And we've seen and heard tonight about the power of universalism, that even as we acknowledge our differences and rejoice in our differences, that we also want to rejoice in our shared humanity. So I want to... Um, We'll sing that at the end, um, a popular melody to those words. But I wanted to share with you a, a closing poem that some of you may be familiar with that also emphasizes the flip side of this universality. Um, and this is a poem written by Reverend Niemöller. He was a German Lutheran pastor. And it's a very profound poem that talks about how the work is really incumbent upon all of us and why. First they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me. But in a world when we really take the idea of peace seriously, not only for the people in our own small group, but for all of humanity, then we can protect against a world where hate um, will reign over love and, and instead will lift up love through the peace. So if you don't know these words, don't worry about it. You can sing it on a lie, lie, lie. Um, a, a Jewish nigun, as we call it, a wordless melody. Oh, who says shalom bimrama? Who ya say shalom aleinu? Ve'al kol Yisrael, ve'al kol Yosh ve'tevel. Ya say shalom, ya say shalom. Shalom Aleinu, ve'al kol Yisrael, ve'al kol Yoshvei Tevel, yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom Aleinu, ve'al kol Yisrael, ve'al kol Yoshvei Tevel. May we all feel the warmth of peace and love here in Marin and throughout our world, and we say, Amen. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Blessings and peace. Mm.